Okay, let's open our Bibles. Let's go to Matthew chapter 17. And today we are going to be studying verses 9 through 13. Matthew 17, verses 9 through 13. Let's read our text, and then let's together dig into the text. Starting in verse 9, we are told, As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. And his disciples asked him, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And Jesus answered and said, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah already came, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that Jesus had spoken to them about John the Baptist. This is God's holy, inspired, authoritative word of truth. And all of God's people say, Amen. Okay, well, as you can see on the screen behind me, the title of our message is the coming of Elijah. If you were with us last week, we saw Jesus up on the mountain, the mountain that eventually came to be known as the Mount of Transfiguration. And we saw last week, or we got last week, a glimpse of Christ's glory where he was transfigured before three of the apostles, Peter, James, and John. We also saw how Moses and Elijah appeared, speaking to Jesus about what was going to happen to him in Jerusalem. We also heard the voice of the Father from heaven declaring about Jesus before the three disciples, This is my Son, the Beloved One, with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to Him. That all occurred, as we saw last week in chapter 17, verses 1 through 8. We got a glimpse of Christ's glory. Well, today we are going to see Jesus and the three apostles coming down from the mountain. And we are going to see our Lord's promise of his suffering. Last week, a glimpse of Christ's glory. This week, the promise of of Christ's suffering. And we are also going to see how Jesus was speaking about Elijah and that the disciples here in verse 13 understood that Jesus had spoken to them when he was talking to them about Elijah, Old Testament prophet, the disciples understood that Jesus had spoken to them about, wait a second, John the Baptist? Does this mean, was Jesus teaching reincarnation? That John the Baptist was a reincarnated Elijah? Is that what Jesus was teaching as some Hindus claim? Jesus was teaching about reincarnation? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> we know Hebrews 9.27, it is appointed for a person to die once and immediately face judgment. Therefore, there is no such thing as reincarnation, nor is there any such thing as purgatory. 
nor is there any such thing of spirits kind of being in limbo land after they die and living people being baptized for them so they can make their way up to some celestial area. No, 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 no. It is appointed for a person to die once. And that's it, my friends. Immediately face judgment. So Jesus here was obviously not teaching the false heretical doctrine of reincarnation that many Hindus and New Agers like to teach. Nor was Jesus teaching anything here about purgatory that the Catholics like to talk about. Nor was Jesus talking about somebody being baptized, somebody living for a dead loved one whose spirit was in limbo as the Mormons do. No. We're going to take a look at what Jesus was talking about when he talked about Elijah, the famous Old Testament prophet. And the disciples understood that Jesus was actually talking about John the Baptist. Let's set up our context. Hop over to verse 28. If you were with us over the last few weeks, we saw how Jesus and the Twelve were in the area of Caesarea Philippi. And it was there in verse 28 that Jesus made a prediction. He said, truly I say to you, talking to the Twelve, there are some of those, not all of you Twelve, but just some of you, who are standing here who will not taste death until you see the Son of Man, Jesus referring to himself, coming in his kingdom, his Basilea kingdom, referring to his regal or royal splendor. So Jesus here in Caesarea Philippi, verse 28, makes this prediction. To the twelve, some of you here are not going to see death before you see me coming in my royal or regal splendor. Well, that prediction was fulfilled when? Chapter 17, the text we started studying last week, verse 1, six days later. <laughs> Jesus took with him not all of the twelve, but some, Peter, James, and John, his brother. And Jesus led them up on a high mountain by themselves. Again, we're not sure exactly which mountain this was. It was obviously in the vicinity of Caesarea Philippi because the Lord and the twelve had made their way from Caesarea Philippi. They had been walking about six days. So they didn't get very far. So this mountain was somewhere in the vicinity of Caesarea Philippi. Again, our Lord, as they left Caesarea Philippi, they were slowly making their way down to Jerusalem, where our Lord would be crucified. He would die. He would be buried. But the, three days later, he would rise in victory. So they were somewhere near in the vicinity of Caesarea Philippi. Jesus took with him three of the twelve apostles, his inner circle, Peter, James, and John. Verse 2, we're told that he was transfigured before them. Metamorpho. That's where we get our English word metamorphosis. There was a massive metamorphosis change in our Lord. He was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. The three had the unspeakable privilege there up on that mountain to get a glimpse of Christ's glory. His divine glory shone from the inside out. They didn't get, obviously, full picture of His glory because they would have been incinerated had our Lord revealed His full glory to them, right? They just got a glimpse of His glory. 
His face shone like the sun. His garments were as white as light. And then verse 3, we're told, And behold, Moses, symbolic of the Old Testament law, and Elijah, symbolic of the Old Testament prophets, the law and prophets, which pointed to the coming Messiah. Behold, Moses and Elijah appeared, and they were talking with Jesus. Luke's version tells us exactly what they were talking about. They were talking about our Lord's departure, his exodon, where we get our word exodus. They were talking about his departure, i.e. what was going to happen to him in Jerusalem. But of course, Moses, the law, Elijah, and the prophets all pointed to what was going to happen to the Messiah there in Jerusalem, right? So up on this mountain, the three, the inner circle, they got a glimpse of Christ's glory. Suddenly Moses, Elijah appeared. They're speaking to Jesus about what was going to happen to him in Jerusalem. And we're told, verse 5, verse 4, Peter. Oh, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, why did you have to open your mouth here? Why didn't you just stay silent and just enjoy this most incredible glimpse of Christ's glory? But no, we're told, Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. You think, Peter? <laughs> if you wish, I will make three tabernacles here or sacred tents. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. In other words, Peter was saying, Lord, I've got a great idea. Let's forget Jerusalem. I know you and Moses and Elijah are talking about your departure. But let's forget Jerusalem. In fact, let's forget the other nine apostles who are down below at the bottom of the mountain. Lord, it is good for me to be here, for us to be here. How about I make some sacred tents and we can just stay here forever. Well, suddenly we're told in verse 5, while Peter was still speaking, without first thinking, we're told that a bright cloud overshadowed them. This is God the Father. And behold, a voice out of the cloud said, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. He is the perfect one, the sinless one, the chosen one. He is the second person of the Trinity who took on flesh. The one who was born of the Virgin Mary, conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, meaning he had no sin nature. And as the perfect God-man, Jesus Christ lived a perfect life fulfilling all righteousness, perfectly obeying the law, never sinning once. The Father declared, This is my Son, with whom I am well pleased. And the one who would eventually make his way down to Jerusalem, and the one who would go on the cross, and be punished as the perfect, sinless, substitutionary sacrifice in the place of sinners like you and me and like Peter. The one who would bear not just our sins, but also God's wrath upon him. The one who would declare paid in full. The one who would die, but three days later, he would rise in victory, demonstrating that he paid for the sins of his sheep. You know, for all of us, like sheep have wandered and gone astray, we've decided to live our own way. And as a result of our rebellion towards God, we all were on a highway to hell. But God, the Son, the perfect one, came to this earth on a rescue mission to save sinners like you and me and like Peter. And because of his perfect life, Actually, his perfect nature, his perfect life, his perfect once-for-all substitutionary sacrifice, the Father declared, 
about the Son? He's my Son. And with Him, I am well pleased. Perfect nature. Perfect life. Perfect sacrifice. Which was accepted by God the Father. This is my Son. With whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Peter, you're not in charge of the plan. Peter, you're not in control of the plan. Forget your idea, Peter, of building some sacred tents up here. My son must go to Jerusalem. My son must be crucified, die, and be buried, and three days later, rise in victory. Peter, enough with your plans. This is my son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And then verse 6, when the disciples heard this, <laughs> They almost had heart attacks and died. They fell face down on the ground and were terrified. And Jesus came to them and touched them and said, Get up and do not be afraid. And lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. Talk about a mountaintop experience, right? The three had the unspeakable privilege of getting a glimpse of Christ glory. And then our text for today, as they were coming down from the mountain, we are told in verse 9, as they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, the three, saying to them, tell the vision. This obviously was more than just a vision. This actually occurred, the transfiguration of Christ. Again, Second Peter, Peter says, we saw this. Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Do you see it? Again, our Lord up there, Caesarea Philippi, and then leaving Caesarea Philippi, and as he would make his way eventually down to Jerusalem, our Lord intensified the training, the teaching, where he kept telling his disciples about what was going to happen in Jerusalem. In fact, just hop over to verse 21. Remember, up in Caesarea Philippi, when Peter correctly declared who Jesus was and is, the Christ, the Son of the living God, that revelation had been given to Peter by God the Father. Well, verse 21, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and must suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and must be killed and must be raised on the third day. Well, obviously, the disciples didn't understand this, especially Peter. Because verse 22, Peter took Jesus aside, began to rebuke him. Imagine that one. Saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Good idea, Peter. The Savior, the Redeemer. If he doesn't go to the cross and redeem his people, there's no redemption. God forbid it, Lord, this isn't going to happen. And that's why Jesus said to him, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me, for you're not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. The plan that the covenant, the plan, the covenant of redemption between the three members of the Trinity, which was made before anything ever was. This eternal plan could not be changed, praise God. Would not be changed, praise God. No matter how many times Peter kept putting his foot in his mouth thinking, well, maybe, maybe I can control things. Jesus said to him, get behind me. Satan. That happened up in Caesarea Philippi. Jesus then, with the twelve, leaves Caesarea Philippi. He takes the three up on the mountain. 
And again, just as a repeat, we see verse 3, Moses and Elijah appeared and they were talking to Jesus again about what Luke's version tells us, what was going to happen to Jesus in Jerusalem. Well, guess who opened his mouth again? Peter. Oh, Lord, it's great for us to be here. Let's forget Jerusalem. How about I just build some sacred tents here? And what did the father now do? Rebuking Peter. Shut up, Peter. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And then coming down from the mountain, verse 9, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one. What happened on top of that mountain? Tell it to no one. Until... The Son of Man, Jesus referring to himself, has risen from the dead. Do you see how our Lord started to emphasize more and more what was going to happen to him in Jerusalem? His disciples needed to understand this. They needed to be prepared for this. And eventually, after Christ rose from the dead and 40 days later ascended to heaven and then on the day of Pentecost, the, Holy, the Father and Son sent the, God the Holy Spirit to indwell them, it would be the disciples, obviously minus Judas, who would be responsible to go out and declare that truth about Christ. That truth about who he was, who he is, and what he accomplished there in Jerusalem. So Jesus says to the three who just had the most incredible mountaintop experience, they got a glimpse of Christ's glory. As they're coming down the mountain, Jesus says to the three, don't mention this until after I rise from the dead. Obviously implying as well that he would die and then rise from the dead, right? Now, can you imagine Peter coming down from that mountain going, what? You mean I can't say anything until then? Because you know Peter, right? And I'm going to speculate a little bit, but I don't think it's a reach. Boy, I can imagine Peter. Before our Lord commanded uh, Peter and the other two not to say anything, I can imagine Peter in his mind thinking, oh, I can't wait to get to the bottom of this mountain. I can't wait to tell my brother Andrew, ha, 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 you missed what I saw, <laughs> right? I can imagine him wanting to tell all the others. But Jesus said, no, do not say a word about what you just saw and heard until after I rise from the dead. Well, verse 10, all this kind of triggered the question that the disciples, the three had as they're walking down the mountain. They wanted to ask Jesus, okay, we just saw Elijah up there with Moses. You're talking about, you know, rising from the dead, which means your death also. Verse 10, then the three asked Jesus, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Jesus, before all these things that you've been telling us about lately, before these things happen, why is it the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Well, why did the scribes say that? Because we're going to see in a few moments. Because that's what God said in the Old Testament. Well, Jesus responded to them in verse 11. Elijah is coming and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah already came and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. Wait a second. Elijah, great Old Testament prophet, ministered there in Israel during a time of Israel's apostasy. Uh, this was a time somewhere in the 800s B.C., and Israel, the northern part of Israel, started to get involved heavily in idolatry. Why? Because of the king of Israel, Ahab, and his wicked wife, Jezebel. 
Elijah ministered back then. So in verse 10, when the scribe said Elijah must come first, and Jesus answered, Elijah is coming. Wait a second. What do you mean he's coming? Restore all things. But I say to you, you already came. They did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wish. And then down in verse 11, the disciples somehow understood that. To be that Jesus was talking about who? John the Baptist? Let me show you what I mean. First of all, verse 10, the disciples' question. Why did the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Because God said it. Go to Malachi uh, chapter 4. Malachi, last writing prophet in the Old Testament, writing around 400 B.C. And in the last few verses of Malachi's letter, God made a very, very interesting promise. The promise that Elijah was coming, even though Elijah had already been dead over 400 years, around 400 years. Look at verses 5 and 6. God said through the prophet Malachi, Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible, awesome, majestic day of the Lord. Elijah comes and then the Messiah. And he, Elijah, verse 6, will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Why did the scribe say that prior to the coming of Messiah, that Elijah first had to come? Why did they say that? Because God said that. Last, through the last writing prophet in the Old Testament, 400 B.C. God said, I'm going to send you Elijah before the coming of the Messiah. Well, after God said this through Malachi, that was it. God did not reveal any new truth to any of the prophets. God didn't send any angels, nothing. God remained silent. After this promise, God remained silent for 400 years. Theologians refer to that time between the close of the Old Testament, right here with Malachi, and the opening of the New Testament, they refer to that period as the 400 silent years where God did not give any new revelation. That does not mean God was obviously not at work. He obviously was. But God did not give any new revelation until. Go to Luke chapter 1. There was a priest by the name of Zacharias, elderly priest, there in Jerusalem. He had a wife, an elderly wife, who had been barren her entire life. Her name was Elizabeth. Well, Zacharias was there in the temple ministering, and we're told in verse 11, God's silence was broken after 400 years. And we're told an angel of the Lord appeared to Zacharias. The angel was standing to the right of the altar of incense. Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel and fear gripped him. I mean, he would have been shocked, shock, 
Plus, he might have also wondered, oh my, did I do something wrong as I'm serving? Is this, did God send this angel to, to slay me? Well, the angel said to him, verse 13, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard and your wife Elizabeth is going to bear you a son and you will give him the name John, John the Baptist. You will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will drink no wine or liquor and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. Which gives us evidence of God regenerating babies, yes, even in their mother's womb. Now watch this and think about what God had said through Malachi 400 years earlier about Elijah. The angel now under the instruction of the Lord, describes to Zacharias how special his boy, John the Baptist, was going to be. He will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. Isn't that kind of what God had said Elijah was going to do? Verse 17, the angel said to Zacharias about John, it is he who will go as a forerunner before the Lord in the, what? Spirit and power of Elijah. In other words, the Elijah that was promised in Malachi 4, the Elijah to come, actually was John the Baptist who was going to be Elijah-like. He was going to come in the spirit. In other words, John the Baptist would come in the spirit and power of Elijah. And then quoting from Malachi 4, to turn the hearts of the fathers back to their children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous and so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. 400 years prior to this promise, God last revealed through the prophet Malachi an incredible truth. Elijah was coming to prepare the way for the Messiah. Then we have 400 years of silence. That silence was broken when the angel said to Zacharias, you and your wife Elizabeth are going to have a boy, John the Baptist. And let me tell you how great he's going to be. He is going to come in the spirit and power of Elijah. And he is going to be the one to fulfill the promise God made through Malachi 400 years earlier. He would prepare the way for the Messiah. He would preach repentance. Relationships within family would be healed and changed. And relationships between God and man would be changed because John the Baptist would be Elijah-like, preparing the way for the Messiah. Does that make sense to you? Now, it's very interesting John the Baptist was very Elijah-like. For instance, John the Baptist as a preacher was bold. He was courageous, just like the Old Testament prophet Elijah. Stay here in Luke. Go to Luke chapter 3. When John the Baptist started his earthly ministry, look how he preached. Verse 7, he began saying to the crowds who were going out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers. Who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? You think that was a bit bold and courageous? Therefore, bear fruits in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, well, just because we're Jews and we're from Abraham, um, we've got an automatic pass to get into heaven. John says, no, for I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Indeed, John the Baptist warned. The ax, God's wrath, is already laid at the root of the trees. The Messiah is coming. 
So every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, the fire of hell. This is right out of the chute. John the Baptist started preaching like this, just like Elijah preached. And you can write this down, 1 Kings 18. You can read all about it. Elijah and his sermon there on Mount Carmel. So Elijah, or, or, I'm sorry, John the Baptist was very Elijah-like when it came to bold and courageous preaching. Wouldn't you agree? But there's more. Stay in chapter 3. Here in verses 18 through 20, John the Baptist, just like Elijah back in the Old Testament, John the Baptist was bold and courageous enough to rebuke a pagan king or tetrarch, Herod Antipas. Why did John rebuke him? Because of his relations with his brother's wife, Herodias. Think of Elijah, how he was bold and courageous enough to rebuke the king Ahab and his wicked evil wife Jezebel. We see here in Luke chapter 3 verses 18 through 20, so with many other exhor ex 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 exhortations, he, John the Baptist, preached the gospel to the people. But when Herod the Tetrarch was reprimanded by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the wicked things which Herod had done, Herod also added this to them all, and he locked John up in prison. John the Baptist, bold and courageous in his preaching. You brutal vipers, repent or else. Just like John, just like Elijah. John the Baptist, bold and courageous and even rebuking very powerful people like Herod Antipas and his wicked wife Herodias. Just like Elijah as he rebuked wicked Ahab and his wife Jezebel. And you can read about that in 1 Kings 17 through 19. You see how Elijah-like John the Baptist was? Also go to Matthew chapter three. Let's take a look at how Elijah dressed and ate. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not Elijah, John the Baptist dressed and ate. It was very Elijah-like. <laughs> oh. Matthew chapter three. We read, verse 4, Now John, John the Baptist himself, had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Very unique, huh? Just like Elijah, you can read about it in 2 Kings chapter 1. You see the parallels? John the Baptist... With the angel promised Zacharias would be in the power and spirit of the great Old Testament prophet Elijah. Bold in his preaching, courageous in his rebuking wicked kings and their wives. And Elijah like even the way he dressed and what he ate. And that's why staying in Matthew, go to Matthew chapter 11. Jesus declared, we already had studied this, verse 14, he said to his disciples, verse 14 and 15, if you're willing to accept it, John, John the Baptist himself is Elijah who was to come. And he who has ears, let him hear. Right? Do you see it? Makes sense, right? So we see tremendous similarities between John the Baptist in the great Old Testament prophet, Elijah, right? Jesus even declared that John the Baptist was the Elijah to come. But there is one major difference between the two. Stay here in Matthew, Matthew chapter 14. Remember that John the Baptist was thrown into prison. Why? Because he had rebuked Herod Antipas because of his relationship with his brother's wife, Herodias. 
And we're told that, verse 3, when Herod had John arrested, he bound him, put him in prison because of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip. For John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Although Herod wanted to put him to death, he feared the crowd because they regarded John as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Having been prompted by her mother, she said, Give me here on the, a platter the head of John the Baptist. What a wicked woman. Although he was grieved, the king commanded it. What a spineless man. He commanded it to be given because of his oaths and because of his dinner guests. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl. Can you imagine that blood sloshing everywhere? And the daughter went and brought it to her mother. Who are these people? And John's disciples came, took away the body and buried it. They took it. And they went and reported this to Jesus. So we see tremendous similarities between John the Baptist and the Old Testament prophet Elijah, except Elijah never died. He was taken straight to heaven. Two Old Testament examples of that, Enoch and Elijah. Although, or even though, Ahab and Jezebel constantly were trying to have Elijah killed, they never succeeded. God brought Elijah home to heaven. John the Baptist, on the other hand, his head was cut off by the wicked, spineless king, or tetrarch, I should say, Herod Antipas, and his wicked, crazy wife, Herodias, who actually was the wife of his brother Philip. Do you see it? Now let's go back to our text and put it together. Matthew chapter 17, starting in verse 9. Jesus and the three, after this great mountaintop experience, are now coming down from the mountain. Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the, the vision what you saw and heard. Tell this to no one until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Verse 10, the disciples said, Okay, then why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first. Because as we saw in Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, because God said that, right? Well, Jesus responds to their question, verse 11. Elijah's coming and will restore all things, but I say to you that Elijah already came. And they did not recognize him referring to John the Baptist, who came in the spirit and power of Elijah to prepare the way for the Messiah. Elijah came. They did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished, to the point of beheading him. And then verse 13, the disciples understood. Aha! Uh -huh. Jesus had been speaking to them when he talked about Elijah. Aha! Jesus was talking about John the Baptist. Do you understand? And do you agree that Jesus wasn't talking about reincarnation here? Of course not, right? So we see, and that's why we always want to interpret Scripture with other Scripture, so that we see the totality of Scripture, and we go, oh, now this makes sense, right? Why again, verse 10, did the scribes say Elijah must come first? Because in Malachi, that's what God said. Well, why is it verse 12 that Jesus said Elijah already came? Because he did. And they didn't recognize him. They didn't recognize John the Baptist as the forerunner to the Messiah. In fact, they did to him whatever they wished. Imprisoned him and killed him. Oh, the three said, now we get it. Verse 13, Jesus is talking about John the Baptist, who was Elijah-like. 
and he came in the power and spirit of Elijah. Okay? Now notice I skipped something in this text. End of verse 12. After Jesus said, talking about John the Baptist, people didn't recognize him, and they did to John the Baptist whatever they wished, Jesus then made a promise. So also, what happened to John the Baptist? He wasn't recognized, and people did to him whatever they wished? Jesus said, so also, the Son of Man is going to what? Suffer at their hands. Up on that mountain, they got the, a glimpse of Christ's glory. Coming down from that mountain, they heard the promise of Christ's suffering. Just like they didn't recognize John the Baptist, these people don't recognize me as the Messiah. Just like they did whatever they wanted to, to John the Baptist, they're going to do the same to me. Last week, we saw the exaltation of Christ, the majesty of Christ, the glory of Christ. Today, we see the suffering of Christ, the humiliation of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ. From a glimpse of Christ's glory to the promise of Christ's suffering. Up on that mountain, ooh, a mountaintop experience. A glimpse of Christ's glory coming down from that mountain. The promise of Christ's suffering. Remember what they did to John the Baptist? They didn't recognize him, and they did to him whatever they wanted. They had him beheaded. So also Jesus promised the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Jerusalem was necessary. It was part of the eternal plan, right? A plan that would not be changed, could not be changed. Praise God, as I said earlier. And that promise that Jesus made as they were coming down from the mountain, somewhere in the vicinity of Caesarea Philippi, that promise would be eventually fulfilled as they arrived down in Jerusalem. Hop over to Matthew 27. We see Our Lord, verse 11, standing before powerful man, the governor, Pilate. The Jews already had performed their mock trial, but they couldn't have Jesus put to death. They needed the permission of Rome. Well, the representative of Rome in that area down in Judea was Pilate. So they brought Jesus before Pilate. Isn't it interesting you think of Elijah before wicked Ahab, you think of John the Baptist before wicked Herod Antipas, and you think of Jesus before wicked Pilate. Now, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor questioned him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, Jesus didn't answer the plan was going to happen. It was going to be fulfilled. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? And Jesus did not answer him with regard to even a single charge. So the governor was quite amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the people any one prisoner whom they wanted. He wanted to keep the crowd happy. Just like... Herod Antipas, that day when he 
showed his spinelessness, if that's a word, and had John the Baptist behead. At that time, they were holding a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. You know, a guilty man was held in prison. But that's what he deserved. So when the people gathered together, Pilate said to them, Who do you want me to release for you? The guilty one, Barabbas? Or Jesus, the perfect one, the innocent one who's called Christ? For Pilate knew that because of envy, they handed Jesus over. While Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, oh, his wife shows up. And she said to Pilate, have nothing to do with that righteous man. Notice what she called Jesus, that righteous man. For last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas to be set free and to put Jesus to death. But the governor said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas! Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus who's called Christ? And they all said, crucify him. Not Barabbas, the guilty one, but Christ, the innocent one. And Pilate said, why? What evil has he done? But they kept shouting all the more, saying, crucify him! Christ, not Barabbas! When Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather that a riot was starting, this spineless man took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd, saying, I'm innocent of this man's blood. See to that yourselves. He wasn't innocent. And all the people said, let Christ's blood, Jesus' blood, shall be on us and on our children. Woe, calling down curse on them and their children. Then Pilate released Barabbas, you know, the guilty one. And having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. Just like John the Baptist, they didn't recognize who he was and why he had come. Jesus, they didn't recognize who he was and why he had come. Just like John the Baptist, they did to him whatever they wanted. Look what they did to Jesus. The guilty one, Barabbas, was set free, and the perfectly innocent one, Jesus Christ, was crucified. Didn't Jesus say that was going to happen to him? And guys, we thank the Lord with all gratitude and all humility that that happened because we all are Barabbases. We are the guilty ones. Christ is the perfectly innocent one. He is, as the Father declared up on that mountain, my son, with whom I'm well pleased. He's the perfect one, the chosen one. We are the Barabbases. We deserve to be punished throughout all eternity because we have rebelled against our holy, righteous, and just God more times than we can count. We are the ones who deserve God's just, eternal wrath. But instead, the innocent one, the sinless one, the perfect one went to the cross in our place where our sins 
were placed on him and God's wrath was poured out on him instead of on us. Jesus declared, paid in full, he died, but three days later he rose in victory, overcoming sin and death for us. We are the Barabbases who have been set free because of Christ and his once for all perfect substitutionary atonement. Christian, how does that make you feel? Grateful? Humble? And if you have not yet come to trust Christ as your Lord and Savior, do you understand who you are in God's eyes? You're a Barabbas. But look what Christ did. Would you not want to come to Christ right now and repent of your sins? Admit that you're a wretched sinner who cannot save yourself and that you deserve God's wrath, but pound your chest and thank Jesus that he was punished in your place and beg him for forgiveness of sins and the free gift of eternal life because he is the promised Messiah. He is the one, the chosen one, God's son, with whom God is well pleased. You imagine Barabbas back then, when he was set free, how he felt? Christian, think about how you have been set free as a guilty Barabbas Christ was punished in your place for your sins he appeased God's wrath that was towards you Because he gave his life, you now have the free gift of eternal life. I mean, think about this. If anybody could have ever declared, this is unfair, it would have been our Lord Jesus Christ, right? I mean, you want to talk about unfair treatment here? You want to talk about unjust treatment? But it was part of the plan. I'm not saying God is unjust. I'm just saying that what these people did And yet our Lord didn't complain. He didn't open his mouth. He didn't lash back. He submitted to the plan. The great glorious one was willing to submit to the point of suffering so that guilty Barabbases like you and me can be saved. Again, I ask, how does that make you feel? Well, 1 Peter chapter 2 as I conclude. Kind of gives us a wake-up call, doesn't it? When we think about how we respond to unfair treatment from others. Verse 19, Scripture declares that as Christians, if we are unfairly treated, this finds favor. If for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. Have you recently been treated unjustly? by maybe somebody in your family, a friend, a co-worker, somebody in the church, a non-believer. Well, this finds favor if for the sake of conscience toward God if you don't respond, but rather represent Christ. If for the sake of conscience toward God a person bears up under the sorrows 
when suffering unjustly? For what credit is there if when you sin and you're harshly treated and you endure it with patience? Well, we deserve it, right? We deserve to be to deal with suffering. But if when you do what is right and suffer for it and you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. For Christian, you've been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. He committed no sin, nor was there any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him, the Father, who judges righteously. And he himself, Christ, bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Christian, for by his wounds you were healed, for you were continually straying like sheep, but now you've returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Think about how you have been reacting lately to unfair, unjust treatment. And now spend some time in silent prayer after hearing and reading all the scriptures we've read today and heard. And ask the Lord to grant you the grace and strength you need.